So thank you very much for that introduction and the invitation to come here and uh, speak to you today. Um, <clears throat> I noticed I am the last speaker today, and now I have, I guess, extra half an hour, so I can stand here and talk until you kick me off the podium, I guess. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about uh, predictive models that can be um, built based on genome scale metabolic reconstructions. And Hector, the previous speaker, already uh, whet our appetite on what is possible to do. I should note that um, there's been about 15 years of work uh, in this field, and it kind of began right after we got the first uh, microbial genomes sequenced and annotated, and that made it possible. And I think it's important for everyone to know uh, in the audience that these type of networks that are built bottom up based on actual chemical mechanisms, um, genome locations, and so forth, give you the ability to compute phenotypic states. It's not statistical inference analysis, but it's actual computational biological function. And if the models work, they therefore should be able to predict phenotypic states. So what I'm going to do here today is basically to do two things. Um, uh, well, first, maybe I should mention here that um, this is the um, uh, multiscale hierarchical relationship we were trying to predict, where we measure a bunch of molecules whose chemical properties we are interested in, and we think about uh, kinetics and thermodynamics and whatnot on this end of the uh, spectrum. And what we are trying to calculate, of course, are biological functions that we think about in terms of quite different ca causation uh, at this end of the spectrum. And systems biology, as I think we all know, tries to uh, bridge these uh, uh, two ends of the spectrum. And um, for microbial metabolism, human metabolism, few other cellular functions, it's been possible to go this um, entire distance and compute phenotypes or predict phenotypic states. So I'm only going to talk about two things here today. First, I'll talk a little bit about what uh, constraints-based analysis is. I'll do this briefly and conceptually. And I will then talk about the fact that over just the last two or three years, this field has really uh, come of age, and there have been a number of really impressive studies just published that show how you can predict biological functions and what type of biological functions you can predict with these uh, methods. So first, uh, what uh, are the elements of this field? Uh, this slide comes from Jenny Reed, who is now at the uh, University of Wisconsin. Uh, the data that goes into uh, genome scale reconstructions is uh, literature data, um, high throughput data, uh, legacy data, and so forth. We try not to infer reactions or associations, but actually build them bottom up based on confirmed uh, biochemical events. Of course, we miss those that aren't known, but uh, we can at least build those that we know. Once you have put all that information in there, uh, you can mathematically represent it, um, impose constraints, either fundamental or data-based, as Hector, for instance, mentioned. And then you can compute uh, phenotypes or phenotypic states by using various optimization procedures. And I hasten to add that optimizing growth rate is not the only objective you can state. You can state many, many other objectives. And of course, predictions often fail. And sometimes you're happy when they fail, because that means that there is something wrong in your model. And there's now um, a suite of methods that help you calculate what is the most likely reason for your failure. And I'll give you some examples of that. For those of you who haven't worked with these reconstructions, I find it uh, useful to uh, visualize them and give you an image of what they're actually like. This is the TCA cycle uh, in E. coli, or in Enterobacteria more broadly speaking. And you see the reaction uh, network here in the background. But associated with every reaction, there is a uh, protein. Uh, so this is the reaction. This would be the protein. This is succinate dehydrogenase, which is a hetero a tetramer, so there are four peptides and four genes that underlie that. We also have in there, built in there, the actual genomic location of where the transcript comes, and that comes with all sorts of information, like uh, the properties of the promoter upstream, and even uh, mutational data in here, as you saw in the uh, uh, talk on um, uh, the cancer atlas. 
All of this data is uh, put together in mathematical format. There's no modeling per se. It's just formal representation of the data. And then that is cast into a computational model so you can basically compute based on this. And this, of course, is a knowledge base. And we call it a big knowledge base for biochemically, genomically, and genetically structured uh, knowledge base. Uh, as I believe Hector also mentioned, there is now a large number of COBRA methods available for data mapping, uh, for assessing the consequences of loss of gene function, studying regulatory functions, filling in gaps in your knowledge base, uh, and so forth. And there are over a hundred of these now, and they just keep uh, coming. And I think um, this review is potentially going to be the last comprehensive review in this field because it just seems to be growing too, too much. There are some uh, easy to use computational tools available. The Cobra Toolbox in MATLAB uh, is downloaded by many and is popular. And we now have um, similar tools uh, in what's called the Mass Toolbox that's going to be in Mathematica, which has uh, text uh, editing features, as you know, um, can do symbolic computation as well. And uh, it's easy also to represent kinetic uh, effects uh, in there. So the toolboxes are available to do these sorts of computations if you like. There are now courses, uh, excuse me, there are, well, there are courses and books on COBRA methods, but there are now also a separate series of conferences uh, on this field where about 150 people or so come together um, and uh, talk about what they have in common, which turns out to be a lot. And the next meeting is in Virginia um, in the spring in uh, uh, May, organized by Jason Pappen. Now, I said on my title slide that there are special thanks to Aras Bordbar, uh, who is a graduating PhD student in my lab, who helped put together the second half of this talk. And what I'm going to talk about here is not so much our work, but that of the field as a whole and how it has progressed since its inception. What we did here was to uh, go through the literature, search for every single paper that had COBRA-based uh, analysis in it that actually used data either retrospectively for validation or prospectively for prediction. So none of the computational type stuff in here, everything that actually dealt with real data and real biology. And this is just a plot of the cumulative number of papers over time, and it's kind of interesting. This field has an exact doubling time of three years, which is kind of interesting to uh, compare to Moore's law, because this is generating knowledge, and maybe we'll never catch up <laughs> with the information that keeps coming out at us. But if you analyze the contents of these papers, you see this field has gone through three phases in its development. So the first models came out around 2000. And for about five years, there was a lot of interest in them because we had them. And it was mostly algorithmic and computational. Many interesting methods developed here, like the MoMA method that was mentioned earlier. Around 2005, the field sobered up a little bit and uh, entered a phase of detailed validation of models for model organisms. Knockout collections became available, expression profiling became possible, resequencing became possible, and so forth. And somewhere around two to three years ago, there was, was this breakthrough that we now snapped into a prospective mode where models were uh, used to generate true biological predictions, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on. So I'm going to go through a few categories of uses of genome scale models. Now, mind you that in principle, a genome scale model should account for the activity of every gene product encoded on a genome in the context of all the other gene products. So we should be able to compute every phenotypic state, every phenotypic function with a true genome scale model. Of course, we don't have those yet, but we're getting closer and closer. So they can be used for a number of things. Uh, one is to map data. and um, uh, uh, one of the early successes of this field was to predict uh, optimal growth rates for laboratory strains where you would measure uptake rates of substrates like malate uh, and oxygen and you would predict the best growth rate or the best yield. And you could actually plot this in three dimensions as shown over here. There is just the growth rate at this edge of this polytope or the solution space is where the predicted best growth states are. And, and these points are very close to that state. They're not exactly there. This proved to be true for a number of commonly used substrates in the lab, but when you tried unusual substrates like glycerol, the computation did not uh, recapitulate the data. And in the beginning, we felt there was a failure of prediction, something was missing, but glycerol metabolism is pretty well known, so the hypothesis uh, came 
up that um, the cell that we were using was just not conditioned to grow on glycerol, and therefore you needed to evolve it to learn how to grow optimally on that substrate. And that's a part of a new field that many of you may know about, which is adaptive laboratory evolution, and that's shown on the right hand of this slide here. This is just the growth rate improvement over time until it levels off, it takes a little over 40 days to get there, and it's reproducible. And here we can see um, the data plotted in a similar way as in this panel, where in the beginning uh, the data points are off that line, but the cell evolves uh, to adjust its growth rate, uh, um, it, it uptake rates, I should say, to get that growth rate that is predicted, and that turns out to be a stable uh, um, genotype, uh, excuse me, phenotype, growth phenotype. Now, how does this happen? So this was uh, done uh, in the early 2000s. Now we can resequence, we can find the mutations, and we can also map omics data on there to try to figure out what the cell actually does, how, how it actually does this. And a pretty detailed paper came out of the ETH from Uwe Sauer's group, where they look at the actual objectives that cells are trying to pursue. And there seems to be at least three attributes to that objective. One is shown here on the uh, z-axis, which is the best use of the expressed proteome. So you minimize the, the number of proteins you have to uh, make to, uh, to execute a particular flux state. And this has been arrived at by a number of different uh, studies and arguments. But then there is this uh, trade-off between growth and uh, energy production. And this is something Hector mentioned. And it turns out that uh, the cell um, uh, is trying to pay attention to one or the other depending on what growth state it is in. And these little inserts here kind of show how far away the data is from the actual predicted edge of the polytope. The cells evolve there, but not all the way, and they are hedging. And we have now pretty much defined what all these hedging functions are that the cell does. It just doesn't blindly go to the full uh, scale growth rate. I should say we had a paper a couple of weeks ago, or maybe a month ago or so in MSB where we actually uh, not only look at metabolism, but the full reconstruction of the entire protein synthesis uh, apparatus of a cell. So uh, this model calculates 85% of the proteome, and in fact, the functional proteome. And it turns out when you do that, all these points fall on the same line, which is actually turns out to be a one-dimensional space that reconciles these three uh, considerations. Now, another example of data mapping actually comes from uh, our lab here, and this relates to um, uh, enzyme specificity and uh, uh, efficiency. So we are all taught in our biochemistry class that enzymes are highly specific and efficient catalysts. Now, if you think about it, ancestral enzymes must have been lazy and sloppy. They didn't have those properties. Uh, and they did evolve, and indeed we find a subset of enzymes that are highly efficient uh, and uh, highly specific. But still, many modern enzymes are still lazy and sloppy. They're promiscuous, they do all sorts of different things. And in fact, some of the mutations in cancer we heard about before actually lead to the loss of specificities in enzymes like itocitrate dehydrogenase. It has a gain of function mutation and starts doing something you shouldn't be doing. So why is this the case? So what we did here uh, in this case, and this is too complicated to go over in detail, was to do very complicated multiple data mapping uh, from multiple growth conditions uh, onto the E. coli network and assess several metrics uh, associated with enzyme function. What flux load they had to carry, were they uh, essential and so forth. And the bottom line of this is that enzymes that are located in pinch points in this whole network where selection pressure actually pushes on are the ones that tend to evolve to high specificity uh, um, and high efficacy. The rest of them where there isn't such a strong selection pressure uh, for growth rate or survival, they don't seem to uh, sense that pressure and stay in their ancestral, I guess, promiscuous state, if that's the right way to uh, describe that. So this question has been outstanding in enzymology um, since the 70s when this question was uh, stated in a pretty famous paper in science, which is why are modern enzymes still sloppy and lazy? And now we have the answer, only those that were forced to evolve did. Now there's a number of papers coming out um, trying to uh, use data mapping to um, understand pathogenesis better of common pathogens, and this paper comes out of Israel. Uh, one of the uh, papers Eitan Rupin is uh, putting out, uh, there's a lot of 
great papers coming out of Israel in this space, where uh, expression profiling data during pathogenesis is mapped onto a reconstruction to increase the resolution of understanding of the expression profiling data. If you just map it and visualize it, well, you may not be able to learn so much from it, but when you force the data to represent the growth state and the pathogenic process the organism is going through, you actually can generate hypotheses that are subsequently tested, and in this case, isoleucine and this transcription factor here were uh, identified as a result of such data mapping procedure. And there are many studies like this coming out where you contextualize your omics data and often multiple omics data types against the network, which is fully validated based on biochemical knowledge, and then you will learn much more than just from the data itself and its statistical analysis. That leads into the, na the next segment of this talk, which is characterizing interaction networks. You know, people, uh, uh, and in particular here in Toronto, Brenda Andrews, Charlie Boone, and so forth, have generated these two, these large screens of dual knockouts in yeast to try to look at gene-gene interactions. And you can measure them and you can see them, but it's not always easy to understand them. So a couple of years ago, um, a group of people, in including Brenda Andrews and Charlie Boone and others, Steve Oliver and so forth, got together and tried to interpret the output of these gene-gene interaction screens using the genome scale uh, metabolic model for yeast. So you couldn't analyze every single pair of genes, gene-gene uh, uh, -gene interactions, but those that were accounted for in this model. And the bottom line of the, this study is that the, the model was surprisingly successful in predicting the measured interactions between the genes, therefore giving a mechanistic basis for the outcome of that gene-gene interaction screen, that you could now understand why these genes are interacting uh, in the organism. And there are some uh, beautiful uh, uh, details in this paper, uh, and this is one of them that I'd like to show, because we built the original uh, E. coli mo uh, yeast model in 2003, and in it we put three pathways leading to NADH, because that's just the way NADH was being synthesized, uh, uh, in E. coli uh, here and there. Now it turned out that in the screen that every uh, pairwise gene deletion in this pathway and this pathway showed a lethal phenotype, whereas the model predicted a growth phenotype because it used this pathway. Now these investigators then looked at the model and none of these genes here, uh, none of these reactions in this model had a genetic basis. The pathway was just put in there because it was assumed to be there, because it's like that in every organism, right? At least as understood at the time. So as a result of this screen, this was re-examined and taken out of the model because there is no evidence that this pathway is actually present in yeast. And to me, this puts a big question mark associated with automated reconstruction algorithms because they actually regurgitate data like that or could possibly do it. So you have to be very careful with automated reconstructions because you have to manually curate them carefully because they do generate errors like this. Not that the uh, algorithms are getting better and better. Um, I think we'll never get to the point where we can completely eliminate manual curation. How am I doing on time there? Oh, I have extra 15 minutes, right? I got 10 minutes, okay. So I'll go through two topics, five minutes each. Um, first, we'll talk about gap filling. So our knowledge bases aren't perfect. This would be a perfect scenario where we know a gene transcript uh, enzyme and a reaction. In many cases, we know there are reactions taking place. They don't have a genetic basis. Some cases, we have a gene. We don't know, we don't have the foggiest about what it does and so forth. And so we can, um, interrogate now our knowledge base by comparing it against um, um, high throughput data sets. This study here comes out of Japan where they have generated a double knockout collection for E. coli. And this complex image here shows comparison of computations uh, of gene essentiality and other functions in E. coli compared to data. And there's a number of error, uh, errors in here and they all focus on transaldolase in the pantose pathway. There's something about transaldolase or the downstream or upstream functions of that we don't know. This led to a very detailed study on the, on the, uh, on the interactions between uh, glycolysis and the pantose pathway. And the bottom line of this study was that two reactions were discovered to be carried out by classical enzymes in glycolysis, phosphofructokinase and aldolase. 
We all know that phosphorfructokinase takes uh, fructose 6-phosphate and puts a phosphate on the other end of the molecule to make a 1,6-bis phosphate. And then aldol explicit into two triosis. Well, they discovered that this seven um, carbon sugar here uh, in the pentose pathway that's phosphorylated on the, other, on the seventh side can also be phosphorylated on the first side by phosphorfructokinase to create a 1,7-bis phosphate. And that 1,7-bis phosphate can then be split by aldolase into a three and a four carbon moiety. And the four carbon moiety is this classical uh, four carbon sugar in uh, the pentose pathway erythrose four phosphate. Now this was a total surprise, I mean, <laughs> to discover that these enzymes had the capabilities of doing that. And the only way to find that out, or maybe there are other ways, but there was a way to find it out here, which was to compare the output of these high throughput screens um, uh, to experimental data, focusing the hypothesis. Now, Recon 1 came out a couple of years ago. Uh, no, I should say more, uh, uh, six years ago, and it has gaps in it. And now there is an effort ongoing to, tr uh, to try to figure out how can we fill these gaps in, in human metabolism. Now, if you go to the grocery store, and if you're conscientious and you look at the uh, ingredients in your food, you see there's a lot of gluconate in food. But then if you look into biochemistry textbooks and so forth, it's not clear exactly how humans metabolize gluconate. And it turns out that as a result of one of the such gap-filling procedures, that there is a gluconate kinase encoded in humans. And um, it takes the gluconate and converts it into 6-gluconophosphate, uh, which is a pentose pathway intermediate. So gluconate does not go into glycolysis. It actually goes through the pentose pathway. And therefore, you know, the CO2 is split off and, and the pentoses are made as a result of that. So here's an example of gap filling um, in human metabolism. And I suspect that there'll be many more of those and we'll figure out uh, step by step uh, our missing knowledge about human metabolism. So let me then go to the last topic, which is popular by those that want to make money, and that is to develop new drug uh, targets, new drug molecules, and develop them. And the models, as are, is inferred by what I've already said, are really good at finding synthetic lethals. They're good at predicting the consequences of gene knockout. And therefore, they should be able to find a target for you or pairwise targets if you were so inclined. So this was the basis for a couple of studies that came out of Israel again, Tomer Slomi and uh, Ethan Rupin and others. Uh, first started looking at expression profiling data in, um, uh, in, from cancer cell lines to try to look at the appearance, um, the occurrence of synthetic lethals. Now, many uh, cancers become oxotrophic uh, and, and have metabolic lesions in them. Many prostate uh, tumors, for instance, are oxotrophic for proline. So they'll have a natural lesion in them that is not in the uh, normal cell. So the question is, can you find a synthetic lethal where that lesion is one half of the lethal, then you hit the other target, and only the cancer cell will feel it, whereas normal cells do not. And so this is a prediction of a bunch of such uh, potential um, uh, occurrence of such uh, uh, synthetic lethals. And then one of them was uh, taken and uh, studied in detail, a renal cell carcinoma, which has a lesion uh, in the TCA cycle in uh, fumarate dehydrase which is also found in, uh, to be deficient in some gliomas and uh, fibrotic uh, tumors in women. And the prediction was that, so this disturbs the redox metabolism and, you know, where do you dump the redox equivalents on NADH? Well, one of the predictions was that heme biosynthesis, which is a very requiring pathway for redox equivalents, would be at an elevated flux and consume all of those redox equivalents. And that leads to a prediction of an overproduction of heme and therefore bilirubin in the blood and urine of the patients, which indeed was found, and then in experimental animals. And to make a long story short, this paper in Nature here validated the targets and the heme biosynthetic pathway that were synthetic lethals for this cell line uh, with this lesion in the uh, uh, TCA cycle. Now, who would have expected that you could find a target for cancer drug development in heme biosynthesis. I mean, this comes completely out of left field, but is a triumph of uh, systems biology and these uh, bottom-up uh, models. Now, um, the models can calculate um, not only, synthetic, not only um, lethal uh, uh, 
links or removal of a gene that catalyzes a reaction. They can also catalyze nodes so that if they are taken down are lethal. Now, in a protein-protein interaction network, you can imagine taking a protein out if there's a lethal hub in a protein-protein in a interaction network. But how do you do it in metabolism? You can't just remove the metabolite. So this led uh, Sanyo Bli at Keist and his uh, group to speculate that you could actually find a, an analog to such a synthetic node, uh, such a lethal node, I should say, essential node in a metabolic network, such that it inhibited all the enzymes exiting that node. And if you would therefore put that uh, uh, compound into the network, you would actually hit that node and, and stop flux through it. And so using KMI informatics, they actually uh, came up with a couple of compounds uh, shown over here that were targeted inhibitors and went right on this pathogen over here did work. So here's a totally different way of finding candidate uh, drug uh, molecules, actually, not just uh, targets, but molecules. And finally, the last study I'll talk about uh, came out of um, Jim Collins's lab at uh, Boston University, it was in uh, Nature Biotech in February this year, which was focused on um, the ability of enterobacteria, uh, E. coli in particular, to withstand uh, ROS load. Now, how many times have you heard people talk about the ROS loads doing this and that? Oh, I'll increase the ROS load and then this happens. Well, how much does the ROS load have to be before I see this happen? You don't know. So it's a completely qualitative argument. They asked this question, can we now calculate with such a highly validated metabolic model of E. coli, how much ROS load they can tolerate? How much of these oxidative species can it neutralize and deal with? And they did the experiments and showed that you can predict what that actually is. They can also therefore predict, using the model, which gene knockouts would sensitize it further, which genes are needed to, to, to give you that maximum response. They knocked those genes out, and sure enough, they sensitized it. And then they also did uh, uh, inhibition studies of molecules of the corresponding gene products. Now, how about this study? To me, this is just shocking, that you can actually calculate this, that you hear people talk about uh, over and over and over again about the ROS loads. Here it is, quantitatively calculated, verified, and so forth. Uh, I don't know if this is uh, leading to uh, any changes in clinical practice yet, but certainly uh, it should have that potential. So finally, to end, uh, I think, this part of the talk, um, this is a graph that shows how many drug molecules a billion dollars buys <laughs> as a function of time. And, uh, you know, some time ago you could get a lot of drugs for a billion dollars, but not too long ago uh, you hit one drug per billion dollars, and now we're below that. So it costs more than a billion dollars to, to develop a drug, and new methods are needed to uh, flatten this curve out and hopefully bend it, and maybe the sort of studies that I showed you will uh, uh, assist with that. And am I out of time? I'm just about, so then we'll skip this. Um, maybe not completely, <laughs> since it was a little soft. So what I will say uh, now as um, uh, a result of the effort to expand reconstructions in scope, we now have at least two models in which there are full protein structures associated with every reaction in them. This introduces the possibility of computing protein properties and overlaying it on a network. Inhibition sites of a drug or thermal stability of protein. Thermal stability of protein turns out to be about the easiest property of proteins to predict, the temperature uh, maximum. Since we have 95% of the structures in the E. coli model, you can put them this all in as constraints on an E. coli model, and you can now maximize growth rate as a function of temperature. You just dial in the temperature, calculate all the V maxes, maximize temperature, then you uh, walk over the, a temperature range. And shockingly to us, you are actually able to calculate the uh, temperature dependency of E. coli growth. You know, here's data, here's the calculation. Some of these algorithms just cut enzyme activity to zero when you're outside of a range that you can predict. But you can actually calculate this curve, and with constraints-based modeling, you can figure out which are the constraining factors uh, at different temperatures. You can do some experiments to verify that. And that was published in Science earlier this year. So there's a lot of interesting things happening now as a result of having the protein in there. And we saw a talk uh, in the earlier session about the association like of the mu protein 
in E. coli, there is a physical embodiment of that model that has now all the protein in it that uh, we haven't explored yet, but you should be able to. Okay, so that takes me to the end here. Um, what have I uh, said? First, uh, the genotype... I keep getting cut off. <laughs> the, the genotype <laughs> relationship is the fundamental relationship in biology that we are all trying to study in one way or another. The genome scale models called GEMS because they are simply so valuable from a basic science standpoint or a commercial standpoint, uh, provide the means to quantify this relationship in a limited, for a limited range of phenotypic properties. But that range keeps uh, growing the more information, the more knowledge that goes into the knowledge base upon which the models are based. So the drivers for having these models, of course, was genome sequencing. We didn't have them before we had whole genome sequences. We can now map polyomic data sets on there and analyze them in context of one another. And we have these mechanistic uh, modeling frameworks, one of which Hector talked about, and there's about 100 other ones available that will help you to address specific questions. And over the last, um, well, I should say, as of January this year, you know, we picked out these studies, there's a review coming out. Uh, up until January of this year, there were 14 studies that were published in the preceding two years that clearly demonstrate that we are able to do such predictions and the types of predictions that we uh, can make uh, keep getting more and more interesting. So with that, uh, I'll stop and acknowledge uh, funding from the NIH, from the DOE, and now from the Novo Nordisk Foundation, and the good work of uh, all the people shown in this slide. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll stop now and take questions. Bernard, the, the models are getting more predictive, but they are getting to a uh, much more complex, right? If you look at the ME matrix, it's like, what, 60,000 by 40,000 at this, at this moment? The, so, the, yeah, the size of the matrix is so about 60,000 by, 60, by 40,000. Yeah, so that's like, uh, what, 2.4 billion elements? Yes. More, most of them are zeros, that's true, but, you know, yes. uh, the metabolic, uh, the people who do metabolic structures are not perfect, so even if you assume, like, a point. 1% of error, there's going to be around 2 million, you know, errors in the matrix. Are there any way to systematically go after those stochiometric errors and, and find them? Are there, you know, yes. that's one of the issues that comes to my mind when I think about using these huge matrices. If there is an error, how the hell am I going to find it? Isn't the genetic code wonderful <laughs> at DNA sequences? The E matrix that's kind of merged with the M matrix is essentially automatically generated directly from the sequence. The only reactions that uh, need the chemical validation are the modification reactions on the tRNAs, some on the rRNAs, and so forth. So there's a subset of reactions that need validation. And it turns out that if you look at the bibliome, these are the reactions that have the highest number of papers <laughs> written on them. So if anything, I think the E part of this matrix is, is, has fewer gaps and is better validated than the M part of the metabolic part of the matrix, but I could be proven wrong. Uh, if I had to check, spot check two million entries, <laughs> it would take a while to figure that out. But point well taken. But the good, part, the good thing about the E matrix is you can, you can generate it automatically now for a variety of organisms, uh, in particular, uh, are those of interest that uh, already have good M models. So uh, you spent some time mentioning coupling expression and metabolic flux through various enzymes. But even if you were to hold expression relatively constant and not get into the adaptive part of, of E. coli uh, or, or any other bug, um, could, did, did you look at any environmental stress, for example, temperature, you mentioned temperature, where you could see, for example, uh, saltatory changes in the overall pattern of which, which metabolic pathways were used in relation to, let's say, temperature or any other kind of stress. Because, you know, there's the network as we draw it in a fairly static way, but of course what's going to be robust and interesting about it is how it switches, uh, forgetting transcription even, hopefully, but it's going to switch biochemically to a new state yeah. because of changes in a stress or metabolic flux, let's say. So, so this is a fantastic question. This is very much what's on our mind. And for instance, I didn't 
because of time, show you what the nutrient supplements did as a function of temperature. There was a prediction that pantothenoic acid was limiting at some temperatures, B6 uh, or 8, I forget, vitamin at, at other temperatures, and you supplement that, and the growth rate went up uh, as a result of that. So clearly some pressure put on that. That actually goes away if you grow it, the organism a few batches at that temperature. But broadly speaking, here's what I will say. Right now, the me model for E. coli calculates about 95% of its mass. Uh, no, I take it back, about 90% of its mass. 85% of the proteome, the entire cell wall, the entire lipid membranes, uh, uh, all of the RNA molecules and everything. But we, st we are still missing that 10% of genes that create, create all that interesting biological function you mentioned. So we are now going after all the maintenance functions in E. coli, all the methylation, all the protein phosphorylation, all the lipidomic modification reactions that are there. Uh, we are evolving E. coli to downregulate those very stringently to high um, uh, growth rates. We are finding very particular mutations in the RNA polymerase that when you put them in there automatically will downregulate something like 50, 60 genes mm -hmm. that are associated with these processes you're mentioning. So we, if you, if you are going to try to complete and kind of finish or finesse this model, that's what we're going to have to do when we are trying to do it next. So maybe we'll get to 90, I don't know, some percent of the <laughs> uh, genes and, and biomass constituents being uh, covered. We, I, I don't think we'll get the full way because a lot of the small RNAs don't have functions yet and so forth. But that's where our focus is now because we feel we have metabolism and protein expression under, under really good control. And finally, to answer your question, you, I, we can show now that the me, matri, me uh, model predicts regular structures. So if you add a nutrient, and we looked at adenine as a supplement to glucose, it'll calculate automatically what has to go up, the transporters and everything, everything else has to go down. And sure enough, that's 70% of the regular right there. So you can actually predict what, what the need for transcriptional regulation is. Um, and I want to do that blindly. Nobody in my lab seems to want to <laughs> because th those are easy experiments to do, easy to differentially express your profile. But um, I'm, I can't get it done yet, but I'm working on it. So, um, it's going to be a little bit of a complicated question. But so, when you look at metabolism, the sort of enzymatic component of metabolism is very well understood. The sort of regulatory, I'm talking about higher order eukaryotes, the regulatory component that sort of regulate the enzymes is actually much more poorly understood. And it seems to me that from what we see, for instance, you know, looking even at regulatory network like competitive endogenous RNA, which are typically for maintaining homeostasis, uh, that in fact this must be under the greatest amount of homeostasis, homeostatic control in the cell, because it's what the cell mostly needs to, to stay alive, processing nutrients and, and, right. and generating its own parts. Um, so so the, the impression that I have is that the, the kinetics of met metabolism are, are fully reversible. And so when you try to design something that uh, is a drug that can actually kill a cell, it's much harder to do so by acting on reversible kinetics than by acting on irreversible kinetics. Like for instance, some of the drugs that works extremely well in cancer are triggering differentiation points there where you cannot traverse back time. Once you commit, you're, you're gone. Or apoptosis is another example. So I was wondering whether living on a landscape a metabolic landscape where everything can go sort of both direction um, is something that elicits immediate homeostatic control and therefore is, lends itself not, not as well to development of, of drugs for killing cells as much as some of the other processes in the cell. Uh, so are you wondering whether there are better metabolic targets than others, those that really will relate to irreversible changes in metabolism instance, versus yeah. those that well, instance. Yeah, and I think that that is absolutely true. You saw, for instance, the uh, study on promiscuous versus absolute specific enzymes. That gives you a, a number of very specific handles uh, to look at. And in fact, those tend to be the enzymes that are most regulated during shifts. And those are the enzymes that carry the highest flux uh, and so forth. So I think we can um, subset the metabolic enzymes uh, as targets. The alternative approach, of course, is the one from Sanyo Lee, where you find an analog <laughs> to a metabolite that actually inhibits these key steps and, uh, and brings the system down. I will say, uh, and this is related to your question, that uh, the interesting things about these ME models is 
that you now start to see the phenotype is the driver in survival and not so much the genotype. You, you start to take a phenotypic centric view of the world like you know, most biologists do. And when you can predict the transcriptional uh, program uh, based on growth needs and performance needs, you start to see that that's the case. It's not always the uh, transcription factors that decide what happens, it's the other way around. In fact, the metabolic state determines what the state of the transcription factors is. In bacteria, most of the transcription factors have a, uh, a metabolite involved in activating it or inactivating it, and you know, cyclic AMP and uh, CRP being the best known case. But if you look at your question broadly, there are about 20 key metabolites that have to maintain a homeostatic state B12, I mean, uh, SAM and so forth, not, not the, the, the ones you would suspect. That's why I asked Hector that question, whether he was capturing some of those in, in his core. But there are a few of them. If they go too low, there's a stress response. If they go too high, there's a stress response. And those are probably the ones you would kind of pay attention to if you were um, developing um, new antibiotic you know, approaches, multi-hit multi approaches.